Yes, yes. Um, the streaming is going now. Just heads up. I think all the judges here, so I'm going to go ahead and hand out the packet. So you've got that. If you haven't signed in yet, um, your judge ID and actually the session ID is both on your little check sheet. But this is session 83. She was. Mm -hmm. She came and went. Huh. Well, she came in and then she asked how many judges we had in here. And I wonder. And you're fine. She must have had a reason for asking, and I'll bet it's related to why she has a paper here. But she seemed to know what she was up to, so. Just a couple weeks. All the judges in and ready to roll. Understand how the system works. Okay. I would say then it's all up to you, sir. When you're ready. Are my judges ready? Yes. For millions of years, when Earth was part of Pangaea, cavemen or as our ancestors hunted multiple animals to extinction. The woolly mammoth is one of these as an example. Until Pangaea broke apart, this is when people discovered farming. Hello, I am Ian Wake. This is how small farms are a big deal. Large and small farm operations, the decision making upon this depends on whether if you have enough time for a large farm or a small farm or the work ethic that you would like to put into your small farm. Farm knowledge Farm knowledge is passed down from generations to generations. You can't just hop on a 280 acre farm and think you know what you're doing for the very first time. It takes multiple on multiple of years. So the best choice depends on how much time you want to put into your farm or how much work ethic, work effort you want to put into your farm. Large farm operations. Profitability of a large farm depends on multiple variables. What cattle you are running, what plants are you growing, <laughs> And are your cattle's quality as well as you say they are? Look at Lay's and Best Choice. Are you the off-brand or are you the on-brand of it? And physical demand is also a big part of it. You can't just have a 550-acre farm and have only one person running it. You will need more than just one person. It's too much that you can, too much for you to buy onto. Small farms. Sustainability is a big <clears throat> part of this reason why sustainability is a big part of this is you can grow your own cattle, have your own meat, grow your own plants, have your own bread, and multiple other factors upon this. Work ethic is also a lot easier for this due to the fact you can run a 100 acre farm way easier than you can run a 1000 acre farm by yourself. General farm, generational farming. I have multiple years of generation farming bestowed upon me from my uncle, from his grandfather, from his grandfather before him. The reason why I have all this knowledge and I'm so lucky to know this knowledge is from all of them starting from nothing but scratch with just a fence post driver, a few T posts, and just look a couple strands of bob wire. We turned from five acres up to 280, turned two cattle up to 120. It takes a long time, but 
the knowledge that you get is priceless compared to what people try to put money money market value on cattle. The community. Best way I can describe the community for this is last year, me and my uncle's tractor blew up, so we had to ask the Mayberries. Mayberries did launch their tractor, and we were also able to get our wheat in the ground before the first frost hit. The comparison of these farms depends on multiple var multiple variables. One of these variables is produce of quality. You can have quantity all day long, but if your quality is not that well, why do you have so much of it? Family values is also a big part of this due to the fact that if you have a big farm, you have a big name, you have to live up to the reputation. Small farms is also like this as well. And sustainable living. Like I said, on small farms or big farms, you can raise your own cattle from little bottle calves all the way up to full grown thousand pound animals, have multiple stakes, T-bone, ribeye, depends on which one you would like the most, and also your plants. If any of you know how to make bread out of what are we, I do not. I wish I did, that'd be awesome. Money per year. A small farm, smart, small farmer averages around $70,000 per year. But this also depends on whether he's running black Angus or Wagyu or red Angus. And a large farmer makes around $1,000 a year. It also depends on what he is doing as well. What plants is he growing? What is he feeding his cows? What's he feeding his cows and multiple other variables? Which is better? I personally cannot tell you which is better because my opinion is completely biased. I think that small farms are completely better, but I've also lived on one for six years. The best choice that I can say when it comes to it is based on your personal opinion. If you want to put lots of time, lots of money, and lots of effort, then go with the big farm. But if you don't want to put so much time, so much effort, or so much, really anything into it, then go with the small one. I already done that slide. This is my product. For my product, I farm 12 acres of winter wheat. The reason why I've done this is because I can run cattle with ease. It's like second nature to me now. Anything with them, it's not hard at all. So I thought I'd try my good old green thumb out. It's light green, not dark green, if you're wondering. <laughs> uh, the reason why I chose this product is, like I said, running cattle is not hard. It's super easy for me. But another reason why I've done this is because <laughs> My uncle was having back troubles at the time and really couldn't get on the tractor and do a whole lot with him. So I decided to take the bigger step and mature myself a little bit and try something that I've never done before. Never hopped on a 1957 international tractor and hooked up to a plow as old as my grandfather is and try it out. But, you know, as most gravel roads have potholes, I also ran into those. The main problem I had was when my plow broke. When my plow broke, I had to cut three-fourths inch of steel and weld it back onto my plow. And that was easy, but then again, I've welded in the ag building for three and a half years now. Big difficulty was weather and nature. The weather, like, when I fertilized it, germination didn't take full effect because it was too cold. That was a big problem. My wheat was not growing as fast as I wish I would like it to. And nature, as in deers, turkeys, they went in there and just started plucking away at all my little itty bitty plants like this one. So it really, all in all, for it all, it was really good experience for me and for me to know how when I grow older, I take on the farm for myself on how, what I can do and what I would like to do to change it. This is my work cited. I would like to thank my judges for taking time out of their day to listen to me present, and if they have any questions, I would be gladly to answer them. So how tall is your wheat right now? Uh, right now, my wheat is about waist high, but it will not be ready to actually get cut up and seed separated from the stems themselves until around late May, early June. That was also due to the fact of the germination not taking full effect like I wish it would have. What was the most challenging part for you? 
the most challenging part was learning how to run the tractor. I was, I'm, I can drive a standard car, that's not hard, but driving a standard tractor for me was a little bit harder, way bigger equipment, plus with a diesel engine and not a gas. Yeah, that was, I bit off a little bit more than what I could chew at the moment, but as time went on, I learned it and got better at it, and well, here we are now. Who was your mentor and how did they help you through this project? Ms. Brotherton was my mentor and she helped me tremendously throughout the whole entire thing with testing with testing the pH levels in the soil to helping me figure out how I can get deer away from my weed. She has done so much for me, I cannot thank her enough because if it wasn't for her, it probably would not turn out near as good as it did. And what is the secret to keeping deer out? Secret to deep in keeping deer out? is just build a fence all the way around it. Right? <laughs> I was looking for something easier, sorry. <laughs> no, it was not easy, but, you know, that's just how life is. Are you expecting to make a profit in this? It, you can make a profit, but I also <laughs> didn't do this to make a profit. I done it to donate the fee to the FFA organization for the school farm, so that way they don't, know, they don't have to go and spend so much money on feed for their cattle. And I also plan on rolling up the extras into hay bales and putting it on local farmer's market because as far as I know at Pomona, not a whole lot of farmers have a whole lot of hay that's coming up winter, so or anything to help out my fellow farmer. So what are your plans after graduation? After graduation, I leave out May 13th to go be a welder's helper in Kentucky. I'll be starting off making twenty five fifty an hour. Do my judges have any more questions? Again, I would like to say thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to my presentation. All right, nice. Good job, Ian. It was good. Thank you. Um, Trying to make sure there's anything I need to remind you guys to do. Of course, you're working on your dozen thing, and when you're done submitting that, it should clear out. I'm supposed to remind you that we are live streaming. So, kind things only. <laughs> and you guys are welcome to take those uh, packets with you, or if you want, if I don't know if you're leaving the room, or if you've got another presentation here, but I can take them back to you. Whichever works for you. I'll go ahead and open this if that's okay. That's fine. I think we need to get some airflow in here anyways. I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm excited for next year because then I get to visit. <laughs> Fun fact for anyone who doesn't know, I love talking. <laughs> <laughs> like public speaking. I mean, I once had to do an entire debate around 11 o'clock at night because they didn't to find judges. So we stayed at the school and we were watching that. Oh, I was definitely tired and really hungry. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, now I've been through it all thanks to speech and debate, so I feel prepared for the next year. <laughs> yeah. Told yeah, us just water down. The she should be down for the rest yeah. of the. I'm just gonna camp here, huh? Yep. Yep. Right. Set up your board. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh no, yeah, this one too. Put it in there. <laughs> Let me go ahead and give you the, the lady. <laughs> Did you already pick up Ian's papers? Oh, no, I can lunch them back. I can. I mean, I'm no. assuming you probably don't want to just keep them for posterity. <laughs> but if you'd like to, you may. Thank you for offering this. Yeah. Let me take. Thank you. That's amazing. Oh, I didn't want to think about that, but I guess oh, it works. Yeah, double meaning. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm just looking at you would expect no less of us. 
If you haven't logged in yet and you didn't see the number for this presentation, it is 45. Mm -hmm. Judges successfully get logged in. Good to go. Okay, fantastic. Judges ready? Okay. In the wise words of Nelson Mandela, overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity, but an act of justice. Good evening, I'm Carissa Green. Most people ask me, why did I choose poverty? I chose poverty because of my family history. Growing up, I had a single mother who raised five children on her own. We struggled immensely with poverty, and she left us home most of the time caring for the other children. I also chose poverty because uh, I want others to see they can change the future as I am changing mine. What causes poverty? There are many things that contribute to why poverty occurs. First thing and the second thing, they tie together. Drugs and violence. Once you start doing drugs, uh, <clears throat> you become violent and you lose your sense of right and wrong and your responsibilities no longer are a responsibility. Lack of parental guidance also ties with teenage pregnancies. Lack of parental guidance occurs a lot because most children have a parent who works a full-time job and is not able to be with them the amount of time that they need, which leads them to look to drugs or violence or sex for attention, which leads to teenage pregnancies. <laughs> Raising a child at the age of 16 will lead you to poverty because you start at such a young age working a minimum wage job and having to take care of yourself and a child. There are many things that, that will help po uh, poverty. 
things such well, welfare is the system which it is SNAP, Medicaid, unemployment, and HUD. SNAP, otherwise known as food stamps, is tax free money. Well, ta yeah, it's tax free money that's loading onto a card. You go to the store and you purchase food, but no taxes are added to them. The amount of money you make in a year as either a single parent or a married parent will help you qualify for SNAP and Medicaid. Medicaid is something that you get whenever you fall under a certain amount of money that you make in a year. And it allows you to pay for your child's doctor's visits. Uh, and it applies to people under the age of 18 most of the time. And it allows you to be able to go to the dentist, to the eye doctor, and even just day-to-day -day visits when you get sick. Unemployment is provided to people who get fired. And it only lasts for a certain amount of time. So it depends on how long you have worked at the place. You are provided with money for your daily necessities, but not your bills. And it only is there for you for your convenience because you need it for like gas to go to a job. A phone bill so you can call and check on your application. HUD is a program that is eligible for most of the time single mothers who are raising children by themselves. It allows you to pay your utility bill or your house payment. And it also can lower the amount that you pay for rent. <coughs> There are psychological effects that come with poverty. It attacks your brain mentally, emotionally, and physically. Stress is a really high factor as to why you are affected emotionally and mentally. You worry on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you're the mother or the child, where your food's going to come from, how your electricity bill is going to get paid, or even if you'll have a roof over your head for the next <clears> month. And it takes a toll on you physically because it just weighs you down as you go. And if you, the more you dwell on it, the harder it's going to be for you to live your everyday, everyday life without depression or anxiety. And it physically also brings you down because some children don't get the right amount of food and the right nutrition that they need day to day, so they get malnourished. So it prohibits their growth and their healthiness. So a lot of children who are in poverty, they get sick a lot easier and they have a really low immune system. With my research, I didn't want to focus on the negatives over poverty. I wanted to focus on the positive. I wanted to show people that you can overcome poverty and that there are many ways to accomplish this. My first one was being educated, is education. Education is the main thing that comes along with overcoming poverty. Nowadays in your everyday life, you most of the time need an education to even obtain a job. Like McDonald's, most of the time they require either a GED or a high school education to work there. Role models. During school, we attach ourselves to usually one teacher. I've noticed that most people attach themselves to a teacher and they become their role model because their parents aren't able to be there for them every single day because most of the time they're working. You have to ignore stereotypical threats growing up or else you will get this thought that you will always be stuck in poverty. But if you ignore it and you look up and you don't and you just don't forget that you will that you can come out of it, you will eventually overcome poverty. With my research, I wanted to lift people and in, instead of bringing negative uh, the negatives about poverty, I wanted them to see the positives and what you can look forward to after you graduate high school. All throughout high school, we mainly focus on high school then and now, not rather than what's going to happen after you graduate. As I went further in my senior year, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with my life after I left until I went into A+, plus and I realized that I had children, and what I wanted to do was teach. But most people never get that spark while they're growing up and they don't know what to do after they leave high school. 
So my main focus was showing people what was available to them in college and what they can study and how to attain the job and how much it's going to cost. I researched the top 20 professions in the United States and I posted them on a blog. I included the salary, the benefits, and how much it costs to go to college and the requirements to obtain the job after you learn. I got my product out there by telling my friends to look at it because I wanted it to be mainly focused towards seniors because they're the ones coming to the end of the road. So I asked them to share it and to talk about it and to tell me their thoughts. My stretch. I okay. I procrastinated a lot this year. <laughs> and I think that's pretty much what everybody does. But I also had time management and work. I work 25 to 30 hours a week and I live on my own already. So I found it very hard to find time to put forth towards this thing that they call a project. <laughs> time management tied in with school. I noticed that school and work consumed a lot of my time. So I was also doing homework and I was trying to stay on top of my grades because they're really important. So that's my stretch. Uh, in conclusion, poverty is a serious epidemic in the United States. However, it can be overcame. Things such as school, role models, and welfare help prevent poverty. Poverty is temporary, not forever. Thank you. Do my judges have any questions? Presley, you said you shared this with other seniors. Did you get any feedback from your friends on what they took away from it? Uh, no, they didn't really tell me, but they told me they liked it, but they didn't really ask any questions or they didn't tell me if they got anything out of it. On average, how many people did you have reading your blog? Well, last time I checked was about two weeks ago. I had 25 to 30 views on my blog in did, total. Did you blog like daily, weekly, monthly? Well, okay. I was supposed <laughs> to do it once every week, but I, I was busy all the time. And then so I had to come in in the mornings, which was really hard because I worked from as soon as I got out of school and until 10 o'clock at night and I came home and I did my homework. So I went to bed around midnight and I was really tired. So I got up. So I did it in two days, <laughs> which I shouldn't have done, but it's what it is. Chris, at what point, at what age, did you realize that you wanted to do better? I was really young. I, Growing up, I raised my little brother. His name's Tegan Green. I don't know if you guys know him, but that's my little brother. Uh, my mom, she worked a lot, and as my brothers got older, they actually didn't have, they weren't as lucky as me, and they fell into drugs, and they dropped out of high school. So I, it was probably when I was 13 or 14 years old that I realized that I didn't want to live like that. So I began raising my little brother to think the same way that I have, and I got him into school, and I got him into sports. So I grew up really young, around 13 or 14, realizing that I didn't want to live that way. You mentioned that having a role model sometimes occurs mm -hmm. during school and it sometimes as a teacher. Did you have one from our school district that you still look up to? Uh, Mr. Hummel. I noticed that I go to him a lot. Uh, I don't know. He's just, he's always been there and he's, he's just a really good guy. So I just kind of attached myself to him. I told him about, I go and tell him about college, about all the things that I accomplished and he helps me work through it. Where are you going to college? Uh, Evangel in Springfield, I got a college offer for golf. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Chris, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yes. 
I'm sorry. I was thinking that the Siler just set that down. Oh, yeah. Well, we give you a ton of rent. Of course, you guys know this, but as you get done there, uh, if it doesn't want to submit, it's because you haven't clicked something. There has to be a button clicked in each field. Uh, once you got that done, it should automatically clear you for the next presentation. I am supposed to remind you after each presentation that we are live streaming, so I'm doing that so that you are aware. Thank you. Not every room has it. There you go. Squirt a blob out somewhere. It'll be all right. It's Snuck in on. Excited? Yes. I'm gonna go ahead and give you a clicker. Okay. Let's look. Do you know if this clicker is like sensitive or anything? Uh, I last presentation I heard of clicking it two or three times sometimes to get it to advance okay. the slide. So I think it's, I think it's I not too bad. Like you can click ahead and back a little bit and see. Is it online? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I, I would have been there. I, I can okay. They don't need to be in the Okay. I'm just going to wait. You got three minutes. I, I just looked at the imaginary watch. Imaginary watch, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I had it on until like two minutes ago because I didn't want it to be a distraction. No, distract, yeah. Smart. Am I good on time? Yeah, we just we still got it. It's not technically 540 yet, but okay, um, everybody managed to log in successfully and good to go. Okay. Awesome. Whenever you're ready, then. Are my judges ready? Every day in the United States, nine people die due to the involvement of a distracted driver. Distracted driving is defined as eating, drinking, texting, talking on the phone, or even doing your makeup while driving. Anything you are doing while you are on the road that is taking your attention away from the act of driving is causing you to be distracted. Good evening, my name is Shelby Detweiler, and I feel that the loss of nine lives every day is nine too many, considering that the circumstances are all preventable. I want you to imagine laying on the blacktop highway on the hottest day of the year to be informed that you have been encountered that you have encountered a distracted driver. I want you to imagine laying on the side of the highway with various injuries only to be told that you are going to be flown 100 miles in another direction over something that you had no control over. This was the life of 10 year old me. I started my fifth grade year in a wheelchair which caused not only physical and mental, mental complications with me but it also caused great complications with my education. I had attended Willow Springs Elementary my entire um, education career with the class I'm getting ready to graduate with now. When this occurred, I actually had to pick up my life and move closer to West Plains due to the fact that I had doctor's appointments every single day. With that being said, whenever I became of age of high school, a high school student, I actually had the opportunity to choose which high school I could go to. And after my freshman year at West Plains, I decided that I was going to go back to Willow. With that being said, I had the opportunity to have um, the chance to take my negative situation and turn that into something positive through my senior project. Therefore, I conducted research <coughs> over what a distraction truly is and how it affects a person. I wanted to know why distractions were so bad on a person's mental um, ability and specifically target a cell phone. With that being said, I broke a distraction down into three different components in terms of driving. First, I categorize distractions as a visual impairment. A person becomes visually distracted whenever they look away from the road or from the actual tasks of driving. A manual distraction refers to when a person 
removes one or both hands away from the actual act of driving, and a person can become cognitively impaired due to the thinking process and the fact that a person can be, become overwhelmed just to having too, just due to having too many thoughts on their mind. And as I stated before, I had targeted a cell phone because I wanted to know why they impacted us so negatively. I know that we are a technological dependent generation, but I wanted to know why cell phones were so bad behind the wheel. We eat while we drive, we breathe while we drive. I wanted to know why cell phones were so severe. And as I conducted my research, I came to the conclusion that cell phones were a combination of all three types of distraction. Whereas eating is primarily manual or reading is primarily visual, a cell phone impairs a person visually, manually, and cognitively. A person becomes visually impaired while they are operating a cell phone due to the fact that they are removing their eyes away from the actual act of driving and looking at the device. A person becomes manually distracted as they are operating a cell phone due to the fact that they are using one or both hands to operate the device. And not last, but definitely not least, a person becomes cognitively distracted as they read, process, and interpret what they are seeing and sending out on the said device. Therefore, I took this research and I know I wanted to take it and instill it into something that would not only affect me, but that could potentially better our community. With that being said, I taught a two-day course to the Willow Springs sophomores and during their health class with Coach Tilly. I targeted this group of students due to the fact that they are 15 going on 16, and this is the year that they will be getting their permits or start driving. The first day of my senior project, I created more of an educational environment. We were in the classroom, and I first started with a pretest I could post myself. As I conducted the pretest, I was actually amazed to find out that of the six classes I taught, not a single student knew the actual laws of Missouri whenever it came to cell phones related to driving. That honestly amazed me beyond measures due to the fact that almost every single student in the class actually drives by, by the time that I had actually encountered with them. After the pretest, I began showing a slideshow that I had created myself. This had um, touched base on not only my story, but various stories. I hit very hard on Missouri restrictions due to the fact that the students did not know what they already were. And I also hit, um, touched very hard on various statistics locally and worldwide. I had interviewed a first responder as I conducted my research, and I included with my presentation um, various facts that the, the man I had um, interviewed had gave me, such as by the way that Missouri's laws are set, officers go off of age discretion, meaning that everything, every law is based upon how a person actually looks by age. Therefore, a person can look like they are 21, and, but in reality, they could be 17, legally getting away with texting and driving. After the slideshow, I presented the children with a video from Missouri program Safe and Sober. This is a program created by students at Missouri State University Springfield where students got together and knew they wanted to make a change in regard to the activities children are typically influenced to do as they are young. After the children watched this video, they were given the opportunity to pledge to a, a variety of different objectives. As the pledge card does say, I pledge to be safe and sober, the the variety, there are a variety of objectives on the pledge card, such as I'll wear my seatbelt every time I drive a ride in a car and I'll put my phone away while I drive. Every single one of my students actually pledged to the all of the various objectives on the pledge card, and I thought that that was very effective, and I felt that I had accomplished something with that. As we transitioned mm -hmm. into the second day, I created more of a hands-on environment for the students. We started off with a Jeopardy game that I had created myself. I split the kids in half and they, request, they answered questions on my story, the video that they had watched, the curriculum I had taught, and just various um, terminology whenever it came to distractions. After the Jeopardy game, we transitioned into the hallway where I had set up two different obstacle courses. The first course I set up was a two-lane course that I had set up to, to simulate a two-lane highway where a person would be contacting another vehicle. The, object, the students are placed on scooters with vision impairing goggles over their eyes, where they were then instructed to complete the obstacle course without contacting a cone going off the course or contacting another opponent. I put a heavy emphasis on the rule that if you contacted another opponent, both players were out due to the fact that in all occurrences in life, you may not cause something, but it can still affect you directly, such as the instance of my car accident. After we played around with my two-lane course, we then transitioned into 
the winding course I had set up. This course was set up to simulate the curvature of the road. Although this course was easier for the children due to the fact they didn't have an opponent, it was also very hard due to the fact that the vision impairing goggles made it very hard to see where the road was actually curving. After we worked out in the hallway, we went back in the classroom where the kids took a post test that was very similar to the pretest. And I actually found out through going from my pretest to my post test, the children learned and retained a lot of information I wasn't expecting them to keep on to. As this is a very serious topic, I did try and focus a lot on the, the reality of the situation, although I wanted to keep the kids' attention. Therefore, Buster the Bear got involved with my project. If you're not aware who Buster the Bear is, he's kind of like our mascot at the school. He gets around and um, takes pictures of the students while they're doing things. He actually was down there with me the, um, in the bear's den. But I wanted to keep kind of keep the kids entertained and keep it more of a, a light environment while also showing the reality of the situation at hand. As I am a senior in high school, I faced very many challenges as I pursued my senior project. I am horrible at managing my time. <laughs> <laughs> I work a job. I am involved in very many extracurricular activities, and I also actually live on my own. So balancing having to work and then do things within the school was very hard for me to keep everything balanced out. Therefore, I had trouble meeting the time requirement for mentor hours, as with my as my mentor is was is a coach and a teacher. It was hard to find time when she wasn't at her job and I or I wasn't at mine. With that also being said, I faced the challenge of snow days. We only offer health on white days during the blocks of five, six, and seven. And I knew that I would have to, inter in I, something would interfere. And I knew that if it would be anything, it would be a snow day. The second semester, I taught my course, which was on February 12th and February 14th. Everything went smoothly. However, the first semester did not. The first day of my course was November 13th. And we were supposed to return on the 15th, that following Thursday. However, we had a snow day. And Thanksgiving break was after that. That put us back almost two weeks, which I thought would be a big issue going from the kids learning the information to having to quiz over the information. But I learned from that obstacle that the children actually retained the information I presented them with really well. So I felt like I had accomplished something with that. I feel as if my senior project was something that I could take my own personal struggles, stuff that has affected me in a negative way, and instead of me ruminating on it and keeping that stuck inside my head as something that's going to negatively affect me for the rest of my life, I could take it and make it a positive situation and movement for others and for, for safety, safety in our community. Distracted driving claims the, the lives of our loved ones every day, but we still continue to do it. Through my research combined into a preventative lesson, we can potentially create a safer environment and community and redeem the nine lives that are lost each day. Thank you to my judges. Have any questions? Yes. Do you feel like you've had some closure now since your accident? I feel as if me being able to go from um, the situ what I had underwent to being able to talk about it and help others. I feel like that's made me grow from what I went through because I, I'll be honest, I hold a lot of that against me. I am deaf in my right ear, I, my face is paralyzed on the right side, and I always had held that at, like against my self-confidence. And me being able to go and take the things that I hold against me and make that something positive where I can help the community, I feel like that's helped, like, helped me get over what I went through. I was greatly affected by what I went through, not only mentally and physically, but in my education. I went to Richards Middle School after I left um, Willow, and since I could not attend school my fifth grade year, the teacher had to come to my class. I was actually knocked out of the running for um, our top 10 ranking, which I would have been at or if not close to the very top. And so that education was all I had growing up, and I knew that after my education had been impacted by this incident, that I needed to do something where I wouldn't just be upset or thinking about the fact that it happened instead of making something that would prevent it from happening to others. Any other questions? So did you come up with the, uh, the driving course on your own? Yes. I, ha I hadn't ever seen it before. I know that children had done acts, like, so we clicked more excited. Children had done act, like, simulated accidents, like, out, um, like, last year. And I had always seen those, but those were 
I, I wanted to do something where I could be more informative instead of just bringing awareness to it by way that I like, I know last year personally, I was affected by the senior projects as in, it was just, it wasn't something that I learned from, it just affected me by kind of bringing like, it kind of, I don't want to say triggered, but it was sensitive. And I didn't want to be, I mean, I, with mine, I, I wanted to really hit the, the concepts hard, but I wanted to, it to be in a way where the children actually learned from it instead of gathering in a circle and kind of just pointing and, I mean, kids, you know, it's like making a scene out of it. I wanted it to be something that they would retain. It would be informative. Any other questions? What are you going to do in the future? <coughs> well, I am going to attend Mizzou, and I am unsure of what I'm going to major in. I've taken all of the math courses we offer here at the high school, and I have excelled in all of them, so I really want to go into something with math. However, I'm really drawn to education because I want to be able to be that person for someone that I didn't have growing up. Like, I want to be able to take what's happened to me beyond my car accident, just everything as a whole, and push that like just be the person that people don't have like, like support system wise that show them it's not just about education that it's more about just like how you live and happiness and having someone that actually believes in you any other questions no all right well i thank you guys so much
All right. Um, we are just a couple minutes out. So if anybody has trouble getting logged in or something, let me know. Uh, you guys already been handed. You've got the packets already. So awesome. And we got dinner. So bonus. That's okay. Sweets and breakfast. <laughs> Classifies as dinner in my book. They ran out. Jenny usually brings potatoes, and that makes the mashed potatoes last a little longer, but. and you will understand things so much better. I remember as a child always wanting to be outside playing and never wanting to be indoors. My, although my, I have several siblings, they do want to stay indoors. They never wanted to go outside, play tag, run around, or do anything with me. But I, I was a child. Mom would be like, Cherokee, you have to come in. It's getting dark. I'd be like, no, five more minutes. Cherokee, come in or you're getting grounded. <laughs> okay, Mom, I'm coming. <laughs> So unlike most kids that would get grounded from games, toys, or stuff like that, I would get grounded from going outside. So for my senior pro <laughs> good evening, my name is Cherokee Hood, and for my senior project, I wanted to show my love for being outside in nature. There are many benefits of being outside with nature. It helps with self-confidence, your health, and in some cases, ADHD. With self-confidence, we, over normally, we normally overlook that because we think, oh, people are going to judge us. But when we are outside, we can be ourselves, do what we want, and have fun. Health. It helps with your body, being outside, staying fit, and, <laughs> and ADHD. ADHD is a hyper deficit disorder. These kids are overlooked because they cannot stay still because they are always moving, having to do something with their hands or their feet. So most teachers get annoyed. But when they are outside, they get to be themselves, run around, have hands-on abilities, 
and get to run around and play. Hands-on abilities and communication skills. Having hands-on abilities, meaning they get to go outside, play tag, play duck, duck, goose, and have get to do many different games with other children. Like I said, getting to do things with other children, getting to talk to other children, use their communication skills, get to be themselves, talk out loud, and engage one another. For my senior project, I decided I wanted to clean up the park across from Pizza Americana. Because my weakness is children and I plan to go to college to be a special educational teacher, I wanted to do something that will benefit not just me, but other people. I have been a man I have worked over at Pizza Americana for about three years now, and I have been a manager for one. So I see kids go across the street, play at the park, and me, that's all I look at all day. So me, if it's its not just me that looks over there. So me noticing that it has been you know, not contained like it should be and cleaned, I wanted to do something about that. So I talked to the Good Communions group, which owned the park, and decided that I wanted to do an update to the park and make it to where kids are safe to go outside without being sick. So I decided I would do it. It took them a long time to let, for them to agree to let me do their park because they didn't really want any changes done. But as soon as I got them to agree, I put hard work and effort into it. With this, I had to sand down the tables, clean, clean them up. I ended up drilling holes in them and like I said, working at Pizza Americana, the Coke company from over there decided they wanted to help sponsor my product and gave me umbrellas to put for my tables after I sanded them down and got all the black stuff off them and made them safe for children to eat at. The tree. With the willow tree, it was out of control, hitting both sides of the building and hanging down, hitting people in the face. With walking over there at night, you would get tangled up and all the branches hanging down. So. I decided I was going to trim the tree. I took the four, four, the four bottom branches off of the tree and took a trimmer to the rest of it to keep it maintained and to keep it upright. Power washing. I decided to power wash all the cement because it was black, grimy, nasty, and had a bunch of goo on it and was really nasty. And the stream. With the stream, it took me the longest, thinking I would get, get it done easier, the fastest, it didn't. With the stream, I had to end up taking all of the rocks out. I power washed the cement down there, power washed all the rocks, had to repipe everything because all the pipes were broken and put new gadgets in so the water would work and then I had to re-put the rocks in. This is the cement before I decided to power wash. As you can tell, it is nasty, grimy, and black. And there are kids that go over there and play all the time. With me, I have a little brother with cystic fibrosis. So he has um, he has lungs to where he cannot contain what goes into his immune system that well. So any bacteria can hurt him, affect his lungs, and could kill him. So I wanted to be able, my little brother, to go outside, have the childhood I got to have, and go outside and play. Because kids with cystic fibrosis get overlooked and say they will never have a normal childhood. But I would like my little brother to have a normal childhood. Here's where I cut the tree, where you can tell I cut the four bottom branches off and trimmed it up to where it would stay out of people's face. Here's the umbrella, which I put in the table. And with those, you can lean them any which direction you would like, and they go down and up. And this is the tree after it is trimmed. As you can tell, it's not hitting the sides of the buildings no more, and it's up farther. The challenges I had with this product with my product was power washing because I had never used a power washer before and I was using one of the really big heavy duty ones. It was pretty awesome watching people drive by <laughs> thinking, wow, is that a woman actually using a power washer? Is that like illegal? <laughs> it was very interesting looking at the people's faces and using the chainsaw to trim the tree. I was helping my father out in the woods cutting logs and had broke the chain off my chainsaw so I had to use his to trim the tree and his chainsaw is a lot more bigger than mine more powerful so it was very interesting <laughs> using that holding that big thing up and people are just like I had people stop and watch me cut the tree like there's like a woman can use a chainsaw yes guys I know how to use the chainsaw do you need help yeah no I'm sure I, I know what I'm doing so it was really fun watching people come try to help and learn more about my project 
the difficulties I faced was time. I work a full-time job and I work yeah. and school. <laughs> so it was hard try, trying to work around the weather and others. Others, which means my brother that has cystic fibrosis. We have no idea what could happen with him. I could get a call right now saying that his lungs have shut down and I need to go to the hospital. So working around that was tough. And then the weather, I cannot change the weather. So I had my icy days, my nice days, and my bad days. The things I learned was planning. I had to plan ahead, figure out the days I could get off work to work on my project, figure out when I had to have it done, and be inflexible. I, like I said, I cannot change the weather. So I had to flex around my weather schedule and my work schedule and others. In conclusion, look deep into nature, help your, help your peers, change the community, and you will understand things so much better. Thank you. Does my judges have any questions? I did notice this. I did not know it was a senior project. Yes. I did notice it. Thank you. It's really nice. Thank you. Is the stream running again? Um, I do have it running again. I figured it was a little too early in the year to have it turn on right now, just in case the weather does want to change. I wouldn't want anything freezing up and busting pipes or anything. So I'm going to wait a little bit, and then we're going to turn it on. That's actually what we were planning on. Like, I know now that I'm done with it, Pizza Americana plans to keep it maintained. We're actually working on making that an outdoor seating area for our restaurant now. And by me doing this small project inspired so many others around me to do different things. It inspired Coulters to regravel their area. It inspired the Star Theater to paint the outside. We're working on getting the back area over by the library <laughs> repavemented. And that's when Pizza Americana decided to make all their changes indoors. So just being able to see kids go out there and have fun and have a healthy environment really gets to me and makes me happy knowing that they get to go out there and have fun and be healthy. So. Sir. Sam will probably have you power washing your sidewalk right in front of you. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, this time I get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Thank you. How long are you here? Huh? How long are you here? Almost really? I'm about to go change and go to work. We literally made a bet about that last night. Really? Who did? Sam. He's just like, yeah, it's up for you guys to clean the dining room. Um, see, we're trying to come up with a new system. Mackenzie, <laughs> Mackenzie flips chairs and puts them on the table. I sweep underneath the tables and sweep all around. And then Declan, oh, I, I don't even want to hear. Just don't do it in front of me. You guys will be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. But um, just so you have a heads up for tomorrow, I'm hiring you for Sorry. Yeah. She has like too many complaints. <laughs> 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 so what are you guys doing inside for remodeling? Um for you know how Wagner's has like the glossy the glossy cement floors? Mm -hmm. Well we're doing that in the dining room now. And then we're gonna like put stuff back up on the walls and stuff. Because Sam's like how would you feel about just leaving the walls playing? I was like, no, Sam. No. That's like you're you're putting it back, or I will put it back. <laughs> it kept saying, "Shiny's yes, gonna stay late and put up all the tapestries and stuff," and we're and she's just like, "No." <laughs> all you're doing that. Thought maybe you're gonna bust through that wall and we take in are the actually getting ready, well, making plans to do that because the next door we own it too now, and we're turning that either into another party room or we plan on doing an arcade game. Get your, get your cabinets back. Okay. 
Yeah. We figured that out with all business kids coming in instead of like going out and being stupid, just coming in like playing pool, playing our games. Yep. I know we have an air hockey machine on its way that we ordered, so what? yeah. Oh, there's schedule. That's hilarious. I hope this thing gets reversed because right now everything's in mirror and you have no reason on the side. That's that's what's Of his paper. Oh yeah, I can't do that. I was used to oh, my helper. I'm getting lazy on the job here. Hey, hey, how you doing? Uh, here we go. And yeah, I can take those. I'll get the clicker. We'll be. Okay, yeah, well, I won't close the door on her here. We got five minutes yet. It doesn't work. No, no, this is one of those pin boards, so you got to use the clicker. But the clicker seems to be working pretty well tonight. It's not like mine. I think I've been hard on it. I don't know. So number two presentation board, right? Exactly. Second, that's this is the second place presentation board out of the entire class. Thank you for that. Pretty cool. And that was first place. that just walked on. Oh, really? Emily. Mm -hmm. She like reconstructed a banjo on her presentation board. It was neat. We're four minutes out, just so you know. I'm sure you probably already got it plugged in, but uh, this is session 84. It is, yep. Yeah, and I'm sure Honey will be back to kind of help run it, but.
Kind of wish. Oh yeah, it's cool in here. Our thermostat's up here. Maybe we can turn it up a degree. Thank you. See if we What's that? Oh. What, what now? Uh, yeah, she was in a car accident and um, she was like thrown from the car window, like as the car turned. And so she was in a ditch, basically. Her mom was driving. I don't know how the distracted driver factored into it. Yeah, I don't know how that factored into it. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That was three in a row. Ah, uh, probably one. Oh. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that, that's, that's one side of it. That's one side of it. Not lot's got a whole entourage here tonight, though. <laughs> I think that's great. I like a packed room. It's fun. I would expect it. <laughs> people just, some of these people don't know you. They just saw you walking down the hallway in a <laughs> jacket and pink shirt, and they're like, man, I gotta see this guy. <laughs> He's rolling a cabinet. He may do a magic show. I'm not sure. He's going to produce a rabbit. <laughs> a raccoon. A rocket raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. I shouldn't distract you. That's tomorrow. <laughs> We are right down to it. Is everybody we expect to be here? Here? I think so, yes. Okay. Move a little closer. Over there. <clears throat> everybody successfully get signed in for judging? Know how that works? Okay, fantastic. It'll be balls in your court when you're ready to start then. Are my judges ready? Good evening. Rubber band and the paperclip. Both simple inventions, but not without use. Both these inventions have had an inventor and have, a, have been patented by that inventor. Uh, my name is Brendan Knobloch, and I have reinvented something. When someone reinvents, or when someone invents something, most likely they will have it patented. They have it patented so they can have it and sell it possibly one day and call it theirs, but also it's a protection because and someone one day might try to steal it. With that, there are steps to a patent. <coughs> Step one, you want to make sure you keep records of your invention. You want to make sure you properly diagram, take note and, of every modification and aspect of your invention. And you can do that with a notebook. Step two, you want to make sure that your patent qualifies for patent protection. You can't just <coughs> put a patent on, on an idea. It has to be a physical, thing that you have to be able to patent. Step three, you want to assess the commercial potential for the invention. You want to be, keep in mind of what it's made out of and what it, and how it could be sold to people one day and just think of you know, the profit it could make you know, for you. Step four, you want to make sure you do a thorough patent search. You want to make sure that you to spend even if it takes numerous hours on the project or on, on researching to make sure that someone hasn't already made this and that you don't end up with a million dollar lawsuit from someone else that has made it. <laughs> step five is the United States Patent and Trademark Office. This is after you've completed steps one through four and now you're ready to put your 
invention out to the world and it can be produced and given to everyone. <clears throat> Something new. What makes it new? The design. It's been created before, as I said, it was reinvented, but it's a completely new way that it's been made. Um, it is, I made it to be seen for everyone and to be used because it, it's something that can be used in, in the schools and by other people if it's modified for other things. And I, I plan on patenting it if I ever want to keep producing it or if someone plans on stealing the idea. The name, I decided to call it the Mr. Please. It stands for the Magnetic Portable Locker Shelf. I made three separate versions, marks one, two, and three. Mark 1 has volumes 1 and 2. I made a mock-up locker, as you can see here, um, to help. I made it to help test, and it's because since we don't have, I can't just drag one of our lockers that we have out here with me in here to, to show you. So I, had, I thought of making this so I could demonstrate, or else this would be kind of a useless presentation. <laughs> um, it's the same dimensions as our locker, other than height. So you know, I tested it in our actual lockers first, and, it, and they worked out great. And I added the handle just to help carry around because it has a pretty hefty uh, base. And it's just, it also helps instead of having to carry it like this. It's just <laughs> easier. Mark one. Volume one. So you can see here, this is mark one, volume one. And I'll get to how it works in just one second. It works the same way as Mark 1 Volume 2, and I'll get to how that works. The only difference is that it's made out of a metal body. The way that it works is that you see here in a PVC pipe, it has um, dowel rods with magnets screwed into them, and it has a spring in the center. And you push against it. I'll show, take it apart and show you. So it has a spring in here and it has some screw some screw eyes in there. It's really easy to take apart. It just fits perfect in there. And it's Mark 1's weight capacity was five pounds, while the weight capacity for Mark 2, what or volume 2, was 12 and a half pounds. And this is because the, the reason why the first, uh, Mark Volume 1 only held five pounds is because of the dowel rod size. It had too short of dowel rod size and um, I thought I didn't have really have time to change it, so I just put it on the next one because I planned on making one out of metal anyway. Mark two, volume one. This one works a little bit differently. It uses bolts, and the PVC is just to hold it together. And it's it held forty pounds, which is well beyond what anyone needs for their lockers um, for a math book, unless you got that one kid that just has every math class. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The way that it works is you need a, a 5 8 wrench and a, a 5 8 nut and bolt. And when you turn it, it pushes out on the, on, the, on the walls of the locker and makes a really strong force. That's why it held so much weight, because we put it until we heard the wood start to crack a little bit. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> the last one, Mark three. It's this one. It had um, a weight capacity of 12 and a half pounds, which is also more than anyone needs for just a math book and maybe a binder. And the way that it works is you push the two connecting legs together, like when you push it this way, and it causes the legs to push out of the locker wall. I'll demonstrate for you. Now I'm going to put it upside down just so you can see how it works. I'll try to make it look. So it's got a pretty good um, strength to it too. And it's you know, I just put the legs together out of hinges and some screws. My stretch mentor, um, his mother had died uh, last April. So and she, and she lived in St. Louis. So he had to go back and forth to our house and he, he was, he's in his sixties. So his mom was much older. So he, her house was an absolute travesty. He had to fix it up so and clean it uh, to sell it, and he had to go over there over a dozen times. So it was a little bit hard at first to get my hours in, but we ended up getting, at the very end, about 24 hours. Um, 
One other part is the size of materials being bought. Everything had to correlate with each other. The dowel rod and the pipe and the springs they just, and the magnets, they all had to be the same size or else this wouldn't have worked together. We would have messed up and had to do it. And it just it ended up working out. <clears throat> The, I had to measure our school lockers. I, gra I just grabbed a piece of paper, pencil, and a measuring tape and measured the, um, the dimensions of the locker. And I wasn't completely sure if I was doing it right because I'm not very good at measuring. <laughs> um, so no, we, I brought the measurements to my uh, mentor and we put it together. And we, we just made, we, it was Mark 1, Volume 1, and we just made the body. We didn't do anything yet just to see it would fit in there. And it ended up being a perfect fit. It worked. It just it stayed in there w without any weight on it, and it just didn't even move. Um, so as you can see, my shelves they do have use, such as the rubber band and the paper clip. I plan on continuing steps one through five, and you know, continuing with the patent process and hopefully getting it patent soon. Um, I also plan to continue my research and development and modifications to make this a really perfect product before I get it out there too, and just keep on, keep it on. <laughs> um, so hopefully one day too, either your kids or, the, or your grandkids might be able to use this in their lockers. Thank you. Do my judges have any questions? So when my kids were going to school here, I actually bought shelves to help them because you know it piles up and, mm -hmm. and that is a really neat idea thank you that is cool i could see the use and i would probably buy it so is mark three is that the best plan so far you feel like i think so because it's just so easy to use it's just It'll be easier for other people because the ones with the magnets, you kind of have to put it in sideways and then shove it in there. I don't want to demonstrate because I don't want to take like five minutes trying to get it perfect. But um, it just, that one just works out so great. And God, I left. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even check, but that's Where did you get the idea for the hinge joint? Because that's. Um, well, I saw there was this other kind of locker shelf before, and it like, it's kind of like the entire shelf cut in half. And it's kind of like the hinges, but it's just like it flattens out like that. And I was just like, well, the legs would work that way, too, if we just made it like that, the way we're making the other ones. So it worked out really good with that, too. Awesome. Do you apply um, this kind of thinking to other areas of your life? I haven't thought of it. <laughs> I don't know if I have, honestly. Um, I'm, I'm going to say no. <laughs> Um, well, being a problem solver, you know? Well, okay, yeah, I I try to solve problems a lot at home, especially, and stuff like that. I thought of this when I was, um, it was my sophomore year, and I came up with the designs and stuff, But uh, and because uh, it was driving me nuts, not like my books stacking on top of each other, and it just destroying my other books and stuff, and then the teacher getting mad, I'm just like, it's not my fault. <laughs> so I, I thought about this, and I was just like, I'm just going to make it wait. This could be a really cool senior project. So I was like, if I'm if I'm still at this school, I didn't know if I was going to move or not. So I was like, I'm just going to keep this aside. And change, we changed designs and stuff and modified it and worked out way better than I originally thought. So it's it's really cool. Did you get any input from teachers in the building, or did, um, you, did you use it yourself in your locker? I did for a short amount of time. But by the time I was finished with all of them and done, we, I, was, I wanted to make sure I didn't think of something else, so I kept it with me a lot. Um, but I did have, all, I used all of them in my locker just at different times, but it was so close to the time of needing to practice this presentation, so I had to keep it with me so I could practice. So I didn't have too much time with it, but yeah, they, they worked fairly well in mine. Uh, I want to remind you all as you're judging there, and you've probably been through this enough times to know, but if you haven't clicked every single little row, it will not allow you to submit it. And if it's not allowing you, that's why. Um, 
course, we are live streaming, so just keep that in mind as I open the door and we kind of move between projects here. I think that's all that you probably need to know. I'll come around and get the papers from you if you don't want to keep them uh, here in just a little bit. Um, I was also going to see if you guys wanted to feel the test on it. Just if you, if you don't have to, if you want to. And how, how strong it is. I just about forgot to hand out papers this time. And so also, if, if you want, if you don't have to, but to push. I had some of you, I think, push down on the locker to see how sturdy it was. I feel it wasn't pressed down. Because I feel like kids put way more than 12 pounds. <laughs> yeah, like they, sometimes they just put their backpack right on yes. there, so it's just... But it was a good option. Well, I mean, that's the bolt one, the 40 pounds. There was one little kid about um, Carter's age that came up to me and was like, well, you should make one that's 50 pounds. <laughs> I was like, well, I'll try. <laughs> All right, so I'll head out. Yeah, that's cool. Well done, man. <laughs> I have done it. Yes, you absolutely will. Okay. Yeah, now you can do it. Oh, how are you? I'm good. Yeah. 
I wanted to create not just a story, but the place for a story to grow. Now, Jesse Eisenberg once stated, there's an old cliche in theater, if you're nervous, pick up a prop that'll instantly take you outside of your mind. I wanted to accomplish this by painting the stage for the uh, drama club play that was being held in the school. I also wanted to gather the props for them and make sure that they could actually have a space where they could feel that they could be themselves. My name is Ethan Aguilera, and if I build it, they will come. <coughs> now, I, as I said, I made my, I did my senior project over the stage. I wanted to create that stage. I wanted to be able to actually create a set that the actors could be themselves. And I actually do that with myself as well. I'm not an actor. I don't really like to be up in front of crowds. I get a little nervous every now and again, but, you know, here we are. I, <laughs> I do like to act out scenarios, though, and I have little props that, you know, I just kind of pick them up, I get outside of my mind, and I'm able to just kind of sit down and have fun with them, and that's what I want to do for the actors. And what really started this was um, with my interest in props. Now, my interest doesn't just go for props, as I uh, just said. What it's really in is from just movies to, uh, say, Nowhere from Guardians of the Galaxy, which was a sci-fi movie that is actually the head of an intergalactic beast that was turned into a store, per se, in the cosmos. Now, it doesn't just lead from movies. It's also from plays, from just the props themselves, <clears throat> and the scenery that I really enjoy. 
Now, my enjoyment had also led to creation to reality. Now, what this means is that the props and the scenery in movies have actually been replicated in reality. And even some of those I actually have, especially from uh, games. That right there is actually a Lancer from a game that is a fict uh, fictitious gun with a um, chainsaw bayonet. And I actually own that. That's an actual piece that was made from a game into real life, and it's viable, and you can actually buy it from, uh, from Amazon. There's been a lot of other things that have actually been created, especially from movies, from books, from comic books. Say, let's uh, Batman's, any of Batman's gadgets, his outfits, all of those. Now, this all really led me into my research because I wanted to prove a point. Um, Dr. Spencer actually challenged me. She said that the props and scenery have a chance to not matter depending on the quality of them. She said, and I quote, if Brad Pitt were the only one on screen in a movie, I could sit down and watch that all day. <laughs> <laughs> so I took that as a challenge to show her that the props and scenery are if uh, equal, if not greater, to the actors. Now, what I found out from this was with the props that the way that they actually gather them is they either create them or the term one man trash is actually <coughs> viable with this. They are not above digging in the garbage to find the perfect prop. I actually found that really interesting because I actually had to do that one time or another especially creating the lamppost that I have posted over there, and I'll get to that later. Now, they also ask, they'll ask uh, groups, clubs, organizations, and um, whenever they do that, they'll ask, like, let's say a hospital for a spare gurney if they uh, know that they have one that's not able to be used anymore. They'll repair it, restore it, and actually use it for their set. Now for the scenery. Setting the stage is what I mean by this is that they, the actors, the actresses, they need to actually have a proper set. Now the scenery, you need to make sure it actually matches what you're trying to go for here. Whether it just be tall mountains in the background or a really complex scene that needs to be used with green screens. Now green screens are used to create something that's not real as I showed that picture earlier of nowhere or something that's way too complicated. Over here I actually have a picture on my slides or on my tripod, I know you can't really see it that well but it's of the armies of Mordor from Lord of the Rings. I wanted to actually use that to show that it, the complexity in the actual scene, because they wouldn't be able to get that many actors on the actual set to be able to get the entire thing, so they just had to duplicate them over and over with the green screens. Now, <clears throat> shooting the scene. This, I found out, was one of the most challenging things that you can actually do if you're a director. You need to make sure that you prepare very well, especially with looking at the forecast and looking to see if there's actually going to be stable ground. If there's going to be rain that day, you don't want a soggy ground where you're going to be able to sink in. This is not going to lead for a good day of production. You also need to watch out for the happiness of your crew, especially your actors and actresses. If they're not happy, they're not going to be doing well. They're not going to perform to what your liking is. And your film and sound crew as well. You need to make sure that they're happy because they're actually going to be the ones who are doing the majority of the work. I know the actors are going to be up there but you need to make sure that the film crew are actually going to be able to do their job properly. That right there is the stage that I actually painted. I painted that stage, I made that screen over here, off screen I actually have a fireplace that I made as well. I don't have too many decent pictures of it from the night of production, unfortunately. But everything that I did here was one of my greatest achievements that I've actually done to this day. It was really interesting to try and do. In the very beginning, I was actually having to plan. There were three options that I was given, and there were th three plays to actually choose from. So with each one, I actually had to create a different scene, try and make sure I wanted to have a look, and in the end, choose from which one. Now, my design, I'm not the best at drawing. I mean, I tried my best, and I hope it turned out well. I hope that everybody really liked it. And I wanted to create a two-layer effect. So what I did with that is I did a wooden design going around the inner part and made like a striped wallpaper pattern on the top. On the outer edges, I actually have stone, which is kind of resembled on my trifold there. Since I didn't have a good picture, I actually did that on that. Repainted that. Now, 
the stage. The stage itself was actually a very interesting beast to tackle. I had my crew's help. They were tremendous. They did a lot for me. They helped me get everything set up. They helped me get everything set out, and I was able to get everything painted. And in the beginning, it was just the bland stage from last year's play. And over time, I was actually able to create it into that. Now, that is actually of the performance night during the uh, dancing for Mission Possible. So here, my construction. The construction was actually used in making my lamppost. My lamppost was made out of a standard standing lamp that was donated to me by uh, Miss Brenda Beck, who was my mentor. I actually had it constructed out of PVC, and I was um, trying to reuse as much as I could. I had to re uh, paint it and actually use cardboard. As I said earlier, the one man's trash that actually pertained to that. I actually had to use my own cardboard from Amazon boxes to create the entire thing. <laughs> so there's a little bit of cutting. The cardboard was, the, the exact knife actually that I was using was a little dull, so I had fun trying to cut that through. Um, a little bit more cutting, my dad insisted to get my terrible hair in there. <laughs> there's the prototype for the head of it, the actual finished head and then the top piece that we needed, painting a little bit of the top, and the full finished product. All of that was done over the span of two days. The page, the, page, the stage got the better of me and actually had me spend more time on that than I could on the lamppost. So it didn't turn out the best. I wish I could have made it a lot better. Now for my challenges. I actually had a few difficulties throughout this. My time management, I, my start time was actually a little bit difficult because Caleb, the uh, director of the play, he chose it, but he didn't get started on it immediately. I actually got started uh, set design in January, painting everything, getting everything set up, and I had quick deadlines after that. They all just started rapidly coming up, and it was actually a little overwhelming. <laughs> Along with that was my materials. <laughs> the, uh, the tech element that I was supposed to have didn't actually happen. The 3D printer that I was going to use to create the knobs for the doors didn't work. Every single time that I tried to get to it, it was either busted or completely packed up and I couldn't actually use it. Along with my fireplace. My fireplace was shorter than I expected it to be. It was warping. So what we did to fix that was we actually glued um, broken pieces of ruler in the back of it, painted over it, and it straightened it out and brought it forward. And to fix the height problem, we um, glued boxes together, painted them, and made it like the birth of a fireplace. As well as that, I actually got sick. I got sick a few times throughout this. I actually uh, had a fever during school, was sent home on a Thursday, leading into a Friday, couldn't come back, and Saturday I still had that fever, so I couldn't actually go work. And then over breaks, it was actually the break that, um, it was the week of the play, it was that Monday. I actually went to the doctor, had a double ear infection, sinus infection, sore throat, and a cough. I had the works. So <laughs> I have, with medication determination, I got over this. I was able to meet my challenges. I was able to meet my expectations, and I got over everything. Now, I wanted to create not just a story, but the place for a story to grow. As I said, Jesse Eisenberg once said, if you're nervous, pick up a prop that will instantly take you outside of your mind. Now, I feel as if I was able to meet this challenge. I feel as if I was able to create a place for actors and actresses alike to be able to be themselves and to have fun with what they're doing. Thank you all for your time. Do you have any questions? What do you plan to do when you leave high school? What I plan to do whenever I leave high school is to take everything that I actually did here and create it on a bigger scale. So what I actually want to do is get into building more and turn that into a hobby and hopefully turn that into an actual job, whether it just be to create for people who go to Comic-Con or soon to build that up and hopefully be able to work in theater to work as uh, like part of the props group. Do you think maybe you should try to go to a university? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I forgot to mention that, but yes, I am <laughs> planning on doing that. 
if not doing something like that, I'm going to be doing something in computer design, which is another one of my passions, which uh, was brought upon me by my father. Any other questions? in the same room even at that. <laughs> Told me to come get whoever's coming in. Says willingly or by force. Come on. Yeah. 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 You know what? Where everyone. See, I can't prepare, lady. What are we thinking about? Thank you. Where's the I don't bother yourself, Chris. Do you know where the sign is? I'm going to be sure to go to some purple. It's going to be okay. If you have one more, it's very Please don't knock me out. Is that you? 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 Is that yeah, they do. In a bit. No, we don't get either. I think you say it's chocolate, too. I more. Are you going to take it? Which one? I'm 
speech for you in the speech just so we go right to yours. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> in the judging session okay awesome. in that case it's it's all you man when you're ready all right <coughs> imagine you're driving down a road it's a beautiful summer day time's about noon coming around a curve there's a deer no harm to you but you're in a 18 wheeler going around the curve so the 18 wheeler is not just normal 18 wheeler it's been equipped with some of the most finest advanced technology now known to man, uh, automatic braking systems. As you're coming around the curve, the automatic braking system has a sensor. It picks up on the deer. The brakes lock up. Luckily, you don't hit the deer, nobody's hurt. But your trailer comes out, goes in the oncoming lane. That's no big deal. Nobody was hurt, nobody was injured, luckily. Let's backtrack this a little ways and try it from a different point of view. You're coming around the curve, the brakes lock up, Trailer kicks out, the deer is okay, but a car is coming. You get hit by the car. Luckily, no one has been badly injured, but this could have been fatal to many people, to you or the passengers or drivers of the other vehicle. My name is Luke Help. I'm going to be speaking to you guys this evening about um, automatic braking systems on vehicles or semi trucks. <coughs> Sorry. Um, ABS systems or automatic braking systems are very well known, or not very, not as well known as ABS systems. They both are abbreviated the same way, which can be misleading to many people. Um, uh, why are ABS, uh, not ABS, automatic braking systems good in uh, motor vehicles nowadays? Well. If you're take like say you take your eyes off the road for a second to change the radio station or you look at your phone, um, possibility is somebody could stop in front of you without you noticing, and the car will stop itself. They they want to uh, weave this into semi trucks now, to where they can stop themselves if say the semi truck driver was looking down or wasn't paying attention. That would be fine. That'd be awesome. The uh, number of wrecks would go down in semis, and it would help 
in many different ways. Um, lives could be saved. People could be um, less injuries happen to them in wrecks, less wrecks in general, right? Yes. Um, now, there are different types of brakes. Like I stated before, you've got your automatic braking systems and your ABS systems. Your ABS systems pretty much just keep it where your tires or your vehicle will not lock up and slide. It keeps it kind of limits the power of the brakes. Um, the other types of systems are hydraulic brakes, which are in your typical day-to-day -day vehicle. They will, um, when you push your brakes, it runs your brake fluid, which works as the hydraulics fluids, and it'll um, create pressure and compresses down your brakes. In semis, they all run tend to run on uh, air brakes, which um, instead of running hydraulic fluid, it runs air, builds pressure, locks the brakes the same way, just different ways or different fluids and methods. Um, so, with that being stated, it works great in a hydraulic brake, but what about an air brake? <clears throat> if the automatic braking system works well in the hydraulics, wouldn't it work different with air? There are many different questions there that I could not find myself in my research um, because they haven't researched this technology enough. Like they haven't test, done enough tests on it and, and I myself could not have done tests like that. Um, so this brought me to my project. I couldn't really find anything that I could tie um, to brakes and do for a project. So I decided to go a different route. I wanted to do something that I could help the community with and more or less for a longer time than I'm going to be here because I don't plan on staying around here. I plan on leaving, heading out somewhere and doing something better. But um, I wanted to still be known and what people don't. So I built a 35 foot over the axle bumper hitch metal trailer for custom form here in town. Um, okay, sorry. And um, my uh, whole idea behind it was I wanted to be able to have something that uh, could be remembered for sure. But uh, not only this, I like to help people out and I like to do good for everybody. Um, more or less, if I don't end up going to bed with something, I'd like to make sure somebody else does. And this was the best way I could come up with that. So the product. Um, the reason why I did this was to ask, well, to help the community, obviously. Um, I had many different challenges. One was uh, my original idea. I was going to start from scratch, build a complete trailer from the ground up, and have it all the way custom made by me. I went to a guy out in Mountain Mountain View. Uh, by the, his company was Wolf Creek Customs. Some of you may have heard of it. And I talked to him and I asked him what what a um, how much it cost me to build an over the axle trailer, um, what I would need, and everything. And he, me and him sat down for two three hours and came up with the mon uh, not money, came up with a price, and it ended up being seven thousand dollars altogether. And there is no way a senior in high school can come up with that kind of money <laughs> and still be able to make it through school and get good grades and whatnot. So I decided to go back to the drawing board. And I just went and talked to my grandparents. And my grandma had just bought this wreck trailer from Arkansas that was a metal trailer. And I was like, well, that'd be nice. But there were some problems with it. Inside the trailer, um, there was a um, lower bed. I switched slides, sorry, but this is just to show the picture. Um, inside the lower bed was where the metal would sit, which you'd have to use slings on the forklifts because forklifts can't slide down and they couldn't pull out of the metal. So I decided to go through and raise the bed up above the fenders about three inches, or not three inches, three quarters of an inch above the fenders where the forks could still slide in and out without rubbing your fenders. Load the metal on, quick and easy and convenient, throw the pieces back together, ratchet strap it down, and send it out. Quick and convenient. Sorry. Quick and convenient. Um, this seemed to work out well. Um, my family has used it three or four times now since I've gotten the product done. Um, actually, one of the other students who used one of their senior projects actually got to use the trailer and to haul one of their metal for theirs. But um, I came across many problems with this. Um, one big problem was uh, money, like I stated before. I could not come up with $7,000 to do a trailer. That It wouldn't work. Um, 
time, <clears throat> like I stated before, time was a huge impact on this because I, instead of uh, jumping right to it like I should have right when we got this, I kind of wanted to take my time and dilly dabble with it. And then when I came around to it, I was like, man, I actually need to get this done, and this is a lot more complex than what I thought it was going to be. And gravity. Gravity he had a huge play in this when I was building the, the pillars for the uh, trailer. Um, the magnets I was using were not the best. They didn't really hold up the metal and keep it as stout and in a good way. So I came into the problem with I'd have to sit there and kind of level it myself and then tack it on. With the magnets help, it was still a little rough. And I just want to thank everybody for all the help that I've gotten from this. My family had been a huge play in this. Uh, if I hadn't been for the man out in well, Mountain View of Wolf Creek Customs, I probably wouldn't have came about this a little quicker. Um, the school, the ag program, they have all played a huge part in helping me get this done. They have helped me push myself to better my um, output on this to get it finished. Um, and now, with that being said, um, many different vehicles can stop instantly, but we've got to pay attention to the way we use them because vehicles can be used as many different deadly things, but also helpful. Do my judges have any questions? How much time did it take you to complete your project? To complete my project, I spaced it out in between two weeks, and I only I was only able to work on it about three hours a night because I had to go to work, and Miss Rutherton had a time schedule. So, in between there and that, it took me. I think we got it done in eighteen hours altogether, completely finished, grounded, and made everything look out nice. See you before. Yeah. <laughs> I like the light of sun. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I just got this like. 
She has on heels. Oh no. Oh, why is it like that? Oh, it's flipped. Yeah. So just like. I'm 
quite all right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So Jenny and I are split. I'm here. She was put on Alexa So between the two of us, we get we get both of them in. <laughs> Still got. I'm gonna take this off before I have a chance. I'm gonna lift it. I got this. <laughs> Where do I point the clicker? Do I point it? It doesn't matter. You can point it anywhere. It'll work from back behind your back and upside down. And if it doesn't work, just click it seven more times. <laughs> Can I start any time? Uh, you think anybody else is? You expect anybody else? Are we nope. short of judge? Or, <laughs> oh, no. okay. I mean, I'm not opposed to starting a minute or two early. I guess it's going to hurt. Okay. Okay. If you're like, let's do this thing, <sighs> then I'm okay with that. <sighs> Balls in your court. Are my judges ready? Yes. As a young girl, I moved to Willow Springs because my father passed away from heart failure. It was very difficult for me because I had lost my best friend, my go-to person, and most importantly, myself. Um, the, um, um, I was put in a dark place because I lost all the confidence and all the self-esteem I had as a young girl. Moving to Little Springs really helped me because it introduced me to a new community and helped me be part or start a new life. Making new friends really helped me um, be, become part of a new thing, basketball. I had never heard of basketball in my life until I moved here to Little Springs. Hello, my name is Cheyenne Figley. And I, I want to educate my, I want to educate people, dude. I want to educate people on how athletics benefit young girls and their confidence and self-esteem. My product, or my title of my project is not just about the boys. Um, the benefits of athletics is the health, healthy self-image. Obesity is a big problem in today's society, especially in the younger generation. Um, it gains the confidence and the self-esteem all girls need to become the person they want to be as an adult. And it helps build character. Why I chose to do just girls and not boys is because it helps young girls be part of the community and gain confidence they all need. Self-esteem. There's a big difference between self-esteem and confidence that most people don't know. The self-esteem is, is our opinion about ourselves and at how much we like about ourselves, which leads into it's an internal feeling. It's not mainly about our society, it's just an internal feeling. Um, there's four P's of the levels of self-esteem. It is perspiration, which is the attitude toward um, fear and anxiety. And then there's peers, which is the comparison to others, and parents, the support that we were given from our families and our friends. And performance, the academic and career wise, and also in sports. Confidence. Confidence is how we sh is how sure we are in the judgment coming from the self esteem. Um, it is more of the outer manifestation, more of the, rather than the inner part. Um, in confidence, there's the ABC model. A is for ability. B is oh. Shit. B is for belief, and C is for contingent. Um, A, the ability for us to perform. Um, B is to believe in our performance and our skills, and C, conting contingent, is for the um, change in our mindset and the confidence we have. Um, boys versus girls. Like I said before, I chose girls because when they hit their adolescent stage, they lose their voice and what they are saying, and they lose their ability to 
become more of those. Um, I choose to do non-athletes and athletes because the athletes can help the non-athletes and help them further themselves into sports and education. Um, for my project, I did it on March 2nd from 8 to 12 p.m. Um, I did third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Um, the third and fourth graders from 8 to 10, and then the fifth and sixth grader was from 10 to 12. And for third and fourth graders, I did various games, but they were more simple skills that I worked with them because they were younger and they were just not introduced into basketball. Um, the first game we played was musical basketball, and then we went into more of a shooting form, Pac-Man, and Simon Says. Musical basketball is I play music, and we have, say there's 10 girls. We play nine balls in the middle of the court. I play music until the music stops. They run and try to fight for a ball. The person that doesn't have end up getting a ball, they come to the sideline, talk, and dance with the other girls and me. Um, shooting form, pretty simple. We work on that L shape and the follow through without the guide hand. Um, Pac-Man, simple, just like the game you used to play when you were little. Pac-Man is you run around just, you have to stay on the lines. And if an opponent comes and knocks the ball out of your hand, then you're out of the game. You also come to sideline and join me. Simon says, as like I said with Pac-Man, you played this as a child. I'd say run down the court with the ball, and then if they come back, they're out of the game as well. This la Simon says I honestly lasted probably 15 minutes because the girls were very um, <laughs> good at hearing. <clears throat> For the fifth and sixth graders, I did more of a in depth with their skills because they're more informed with basketball. We did a drill, chaser drill. Um, I threw the ball down the court and they had a chase for the ball. It was only two girls at a time. And some of them got pretty violent with each other, so I had to <laughs> calm them down a little bit. And I had two sisters actually, so that was kind of rough. Um, free throw competition, they had a Santa free throw line shoot and the person behind them had to shoot and try to get them out. That was also, it got pretty fun and wild as well. Um, form shooting, we also worked with them with that, but we used the guide hand as well because they mostly knew their follow through and their L shape. We also played Pac-Man, but we played with full court, so it gave them more of idea and get them more spaced out. I did these drills because it helped them, you know, gain the confidence they need, like just simple, simple steps. And I also helped with their leadership and sportsmanship, you know, if they push someone down and say help them up or something. Um, challenges, I didn't have too many challenges because I had such a good mentor, um, <laughs> uh, but one of them I did was appro appropriate activities for the age groups. I'm not around little girls much. I have a lot of nephews, which they like trucks and toys and everything. The boys, I mean girls, you know, I guess they like Barbie dolls, which you can't really incorporate that with basketball. So I, it was hard for me to um, get appropriate activities for that. But after all, we ended up Googling it for a long time, and um, we came up with some pretty good ideas as well as we did little drills that I did in basketball myself, so that helped as well. In conclusion, basketball has made me a better person and helped me get a new start in life. I wanted to incorporate that with the little girls so they can get a new start in life as well and help to gain their self-confidence and their self-esteem that all girls need in life. Thank you. Does my judges have any questions? What was your favorite part of your project? Um, just interacting with the little girls. I really enjoy, you know, getting to know them and watching them just become more of a person and getting along with the other girls. So you mentioned something about uh, uh, some dancing in your <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. in your project. Your product. Do you, uh, demonstrate? Uh, well, as long as my mentor comes up and demonstrates with me. <laughs> so, no, I guess. <laughs> okay, but really. So, you talked about. <laughs> <laughs> real, yeah, yeah, real question now. Uh, you talked about confidence um, and how basketball kind of brought that out. Can you elaborate a little more about what? What was it about basketball, just the sport in general, coaches, um, teammates, uh, just the, the nuance of the game, or, or what was um, it? That? It was an overall thing. The game helped, but the coaches and teammates really. Um, I wanted the, the girls to interact with the other girls 
and made them, you know, become more or bring them out a little bit of their shell. And it really helped them, you know, go do something they would never do. So, What do you plan on doing after high school? Um, I'm attending, at, well, I hope to attend Missouri Valley and throw with them and become a coach. Oh, that was so nice. Tilly. Not like I ever called her that. <laughs> yeah, I was like a back off to Miss Tilly. That was so, so used to, I don't know, timing. I am working. Okay. 
I saw this picture of you with white all this hair. I did not think it was hair.
Uh, first off, I'd like to take, uh, start off by saying thank you for all my judges taking time out of their busy schedules to come see my presentation. Um, my name is Corey Andrews, and I want to tell you about the Need for Speed. Um, ever since I've been little, I've always been in the garage, working with my dad, helping, learning, basically doing anything I could get my hand, get a hold of. Um, I've learned everything from my dad. It didn't really matter what it was he was working on. If it was just something simple or all the way up to semi records it didn't matter. I wanted to help and learn. Like my greatest memory um, it was actually last year. We were working in the garage. We were running late for a race, and he decided he wanted to change the oil in the car. We had it raised up on the lift, and he was working underneath the car, and I was putting oil in it. And I wasn't paying attention. We bumped into the to the funnel, knocked it off, and landed flat on his head, and dumped the wall all over him. <laughs> he didn't think it was as funny as I did, but I know And just with the racing itself is what made me focus more towards my project. And that's why I chose to build an engine. It, basically, racing and engines are my passion. It's pretty much all I know. Um, why I chose my topic was basically because I want to be just like my dad. And we build everything and we build all of our cars. We never really built our motors. So I want to be able to do that for ourselves instead of having to pay someone else to do it. And I also really enjoy working on motors too. I found it interesting. And it's, and um, I also seen it as a future job opportunity. And I've actually made a business after it. After building this motor here, I've built about four motors and currently working on building a shop right now so I can pursue that career in building motors. Um, this, this is what my finished product was. It's a Chevy LS3. Um, it's a 6.2 liter. It's like what you would find in like a 2013 Camaro. It's a, they're stock like 400 horse. They're, um, the reason I chose it was it was it, it won motor of the year, but it's also won it the last three years in a, uh, three years in a row at two different events that are like the highest car events there is. Um, one was SEMA, which is like where all the big car names release all their new cars. <coughs> the one was PRI, which is just strictly racing. Um, they're all, uh, they're also really easy to put in old cars. They make an old car a lot more driver friendly. Is you get good gas mileage and you get tons of power with it, and just about any company makes a way to swap that motor in. And the motor's actually going in a '67 Camaro on my dad's. They're also really cheap. I got it out of the junkyard. They're like 500 bucks, so it made it a lot easier. Um, and they can also make up to like a thousand horsepower easy on stock parts because of the way they're built. And they're 
extremely overused so I can get parts from just about any company or I got tons of varieties of options of parts and different ways to build the motor <coughs> instead of just one way like a lot of conventional style motors are. They also have an extremely long life. Like when I see them come into salvage or they can have like 300,000 miles on them, they run like a brand new motor. And people take and put them in old cars and drive them another 100,000 miles and get great fuel lines with them too. Um, I also chose it because of the durability. They um, are the strongest factory block um, out because mainly just because of their design. They use a um, they use the Y block design, which is just simply the block is built in a Y shape. They also have a six bolt main, which is your main caps is right here, which hold your crank down. There's four bolts right here, and then there's two on on each side of it, which most bolts just have a or most blocks just have a four bolt main which is not as strong. These ones allow a lot more strength to the block. And they also have a strong top end and bottom end because of the factory style forge rods and pistons, which is this right here. And most of them, like your rods and pistons, will be made out of sand. These are actually forged metal rods, which adds a ton of strength. So if you're building like a performance motor, that is what you would put in it, and they already come factory. And they also have um, a lot longer head bolts, which this would be one of your head bolts. This is one of the shorter ones in it. There's three different sizes of head bolts in it. And most of them are about this length right here. They're about an inch shorter, which adds a lot more. It holds your head down a lot better, and that way you can create a lot more power with it, too. Um, this is when I had the motor here taken apart. It was extremely dirty inside. The car that come out of, um, was never ripped on real hard or got on, so it had a lot of carbon buildup. And it, and when I took it apart, the companies that uh, clean it and like West Plains and stuff like that, they wanted a bunch of money to clean it. So <laughs> I did the same thing and put it in my mom's dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> Surprising, she wasn't really mad about it. She didn't really care. <laughs> um, this is basically what the motor started out with. It was. Bone stock, it still had the DOD and FMA, which is um, like when you're get on the car, it's a V8, but when you're driving down the road, it, it'll kick in into four cylinder mode so you get better gas mileage. That's really hard on the motor, so I had to delete all that so we could have more power. And then, which I had to delete this panel right here, and there's also a front timing cover, this one right here. I delete that and put a aftermarket style on there that deleted all the sensors off of it. But this would be your DOD stuff. This is like your front lifters that um, hold the valves up. These ones will pull the valves up and basically shut all fuel and spark off to your back four cylinders. And I had to change the timing gear on it, which is this part here, because it would change timing when it went into four cylinder mode. You don't want it to do that. Um, these are just simply part, uh, pictures of me pulling the heads apart because I had to change. Um, the valve seals um, and the uh, valve springs because I put a more performance cam in it, which is taller lobes. Like it put uh, right here would be your lobes. It'd be just a little bit taller, not much you can ever see, but it changes a lot of the performance and the sound of the motor too. And it actually made it almost make about 600 horse. When we went from about 400 horse to 600 horse just by changing the cam. And right here, I was just trying to clean the head. I had it laying on this grate right here, and I sprayed carburetor cleaner on it, just trying to clean it off before I took it inside. And my brother was in the background grinding, and got sparks on it, lit on fire. <laughs> it's not a good deal. And over here, I'm just pulling the motor apart. I had to pull the harmonic balancer off of it to get the front timing cover off of it. These are some of the, the more performance parts. I put a more performance intake on it so it gets better flow. And it was kind of ugly, and so was the block. So I, I went and painted it all. I probably didn't painted it a better looking silver. It just kind of had old burn on it. It didn't look very good. And this is more pictures of when I was taking the heads apart. I had to have this special tool that pushed the valve springs down on it. And I could pull two of them apart. I got a lot better tool to do it now. But um, this is when I was putting the heads on the motor. I had to put um, new head gaskets, all the gaskets in it were all new. I had to put new. Um, <clears throat> lifter retainers in it and 
this is my finished product here. Um, it's got different headers on it now to fit the car. These ones are just what I had at the time. My challenges were um, I had a bent valve. I decided to let my girlfriend help work on it. <laughs> <laughs> and thought there wouldn't be a problem with that. Nothing a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> She didn't put the guides underneath the rockers, so when I went paying attention, put the valve cover back on it, and I rolled the motor over, and the piston came up and hit the valve because they were all pushed down, and it ended up bending the valve, as you can see. So I had to pull the whole top of the, uh, the head off of it, place the valves. I was really happy about that. Also, my challenge is I had computer problems with it because I bought an aftermarket ECM that controls the whole thing, and it's from Holly. We got to put a couple codes in and stuff on it. Well, I missed one letter in the code, and that sticker would not start at all. So I had to have one of the experts on the Holly stuff that lives in West Plains. He come and help me. And he just went in there, pushed one button, and it started. <laughs> um, also, had uh, trouble getting parts coming in because I come in at the middle of the year, so I had half as much time as everyone else did. Do like I decided what I was going to do in a week and build it in just a couple of weeks. So I had a lot of problems getting parts in on time because there would be a rush. Um, my judges have any questions. Well, first of all, I will testify to the fact that you have always cared about cars back in first grade. That's all <laughs> you talked about. So it's really nice to see that you put all of that to really good use. So tell me more about your future plans. You said that you were thinking about opening your own shop. Yeah, um, I got a shop, which is an old shop of my dad's, and currently right now we're remodeling it. So after I graduate, I can <clears throat> work in that shop right now. I actually got like four or five clients lined up as soon as I graduate. I've actually made a bit of my logo and everything. And I've, I've built about four motors since I built this one here. So, so all of that sounds for uh, what would it cost them after you finish it? Um, that one there, if I did all the computers and everything, it's about ten thousand dollars. What you would spend to build that motor? That's paying someone labor and everything. Like I didn't spend that much money. Um, I also got a video of it running. If you guys want to see that too. Sure. Yeah, I don't know if you had to put that. I don't know if I can go to this. I don't. Oh, it's one thing to sign in. Yes, it won't play. I don't have access. Sorry. I don't have access. Is the girlfriend that built, or the vent, the piece that you were talking about, is she still your girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> It ended up not being that bad a deal because uh, one of my buddies had an old used head that I was able to pull the part off, and he actually gave it to me. So didn't have to replace, just had to replace the valve. Didn't have to spend no extra money on it. wasn't very happy at the time. <laughs> so when did you start doing this type of stuff with your dad? Um, like how old were you? Like I've raced all my life. Like I raced fours and dirt bikes up until I was eight. I started racing you know, like. <laughs> They're called junior dragsters, they're like a little dragster. And we basically built our cars ever since I was eight years old. I've been drag racing ever since then. Still yeah, you seem like you really are really not too loud about all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about it, so. <laughs> I'm glad you had demonstration pieces for the pair so I could follow along. That was good. <laughs> I got a bunch more parts. <laughs> Did you know how to build the motor before you started the project? Um, generally, these motors here, most higher performance motors are like super, super temp temperamental. With an LS, they kind of give you like, if you screw up just a little bit, it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of one of the motors that if I mess up, it'll, it'll be okay. Forgiving. Yeah, and I still use a lot of the stock parts and stuff on it. I use like the rods and pistons and the crank and stuff. I, I just cleaned it all up because they're factory style being forged. You don't have you don't really have to replace them. Like in racing and stuff, people swap them in the cars all the time. 
I see them make like 1500 horsepower on stock parts. I, I wouldn't personally ever do it. I've seen them do it all the time. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh no, it's it's gonna be just like a, a street car. Like, that's a car that you can get in driving over. My dad. Too expensive for me. <laughs> No, this is not. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so there's Josh Porter,
I'm not watching it. I'm not watching it. I can't watch it. Oh, oh, there we go. 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 How'd yours go, Lily? How'd yours go? I'm so excited. <laughs> Has it been like a long, man? Because I heard some presentations that were pretty long. I'm just saying. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was in the just fair segment of the house. We kind of did a few more than sitting up inside one chair. Why? Because I wasn't going to do it. I'm sorry. Better be sorry. Wait, but it doesn't say that we're all right, right? When I ask you, you're right. I'm going to ask all the questions. You're right. I don't know why. How many figures? Uh, <laughs> it's like, are you making a fist? Because all I see is a no. straight line. No. I want that. See that? Straight forward. Do that. I need to move. I think I'd love to. I'm so good. It's all right. We still got a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah, we're good. It's all right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I am a friend. My heart hurts now. Thank you. That's good. That's good. Thank you, dude. It looks so good. Um, you said many times hair. I did that, yeah. That, that helped a lot. How long did your hair be? It's a tiny speech. Yeah, I did see a song. I was like, we are there. We're good. Everybody get logged in successfully? For yes. Judging? I'm ready. I'm ready to judge. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Good job, Martin. I got you. All right. It's your ball, man. All right. Are we judges ready? Yes. Big question. Do you ever make impulse decisions? And I don't mean just going down to the nearest supermarket and buying a third freezer for your uh, for your dining room because the commercial said this one glows in the dark. Or maybe it makes a little star-shaped ice cubes instead of the traditional cubes or trapezoids. <laughs> Imagine you were in a music class. You were in band or you were in choir. And you're given a solo for your upcoming spring concert, but you're only given three days to prepare for it. Now imagine you forget to take your instrument home or your music, your sheet music. Um, what do you have left to do? I mean, your deadline's coming up, and you can't practice that solo. But you can improvise. Good evening. I'm Caleb Riley with The Beauty of Improv, and I'm just going to wing. <laughs> <laughs> For my research, um, I actually researched improvisational dance. Uh, now, my product was actually improvisational music. It was a, uh, it was a stomp band, um, uh, but, but I researched dance. Um, what I found in my research is that improvisation lacks structure. Um, obviously, it's all based on emotion. It's all based on, um, it's off the top of your head. It's spontaneous. Um, Take like jazz for instance. Jazz, uh, it's also based mostly on emotion, but it does have what uh, musicians call a blues backbone. It's it, it's like improv, but it's it's still got you know the the, the blues type. It's it's still a, its own genre of music. Um, but what I found is that improv is actually a very good skill um, worth mastering. Uh, it'll help you in 
um, several parts, the several aspects of life other than uh, any art performance, whether it be music or theater or dance. Um, my research also proved that uh, relying on predetermined choreography of any type of performance uh, can lead to insecurities and stress in the performance itself due to the fact that you don't have the amount of um, uh, the amount of room to sway your performance with emotion. Um, my interests, I talk about this a lot, but it's actually a huge hindrance on my day-to-day -day life. <laughs> 18 years ago, I was born with congenetic nystagmus. Now, what this means is that my eyes uh, move in a swing in a pendulum-type movement as they oscillate. Um, at the moment, I actually cannot see uh, my judges. My eyes move all the time, but I'm going to try my best to make eye contact as much as I can. Um, all throughout middle school and high school, I've been very interested in band, all types of music. Um, mostly marching band, but concert band's good too. Now, <laughs> <laughs> since uh, my eyes shake so hard, um, I don't have peripheral vision at all. Um, and I have a very hard time seeing out of my right eye in general. Um, due to this, okay, I play a tuba. So in concert band, I have to sit sideways on my chair with a tuba on the corner of my chair and look out of the corner of my eye to see my music, but I can't do that because I don't have peripheral vision. So uh, I have to read the music, memorize what I can, put it back and try to improv the rest. Um, <laughs> but I love music, it's just hard to read. It, even, even in marching band, uh, my tuba sits on my left shoulder, but I can't see out of my right eye, so I can't really stay in line. <laughs> I try really hard. <laughs> um, I, but I love music to death, and I always have. Uh, the band's, the band's just my tempo. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's, it's forced, uh, forced me to improvise, and I, I think that I'm getting a lot better at it 18 years later. Uh, <laughs> intention versus reality. Like I said, I did a stomp band. Now, uh, I intended to choreograph a um, theatrical music performance. Uh, okay, I thought I clicked back. But... Uh, <laughs> It, it ended up kind of falling apart. I didn't have the materials that I needed for my original theme, so I wasn't able to um, form what I wanted uh, on, on, on the actual due date. Um, and, and due to that, we were, we were forced to improvise, me and my crew, but it went very well, and I actually got a pretty good score, and I'm very thankful for that in my crew. Um, also seeing other singer projects, I started to feel a little bit better. And that's not to say that the other singer projects were bad, but they also had uh, some of the same problems that I had started to face. Uh, tools, uh, again, I did a stomp band. Now, with a stomp band, um, the rule is you're not allowed to use any traditional instrument. You can't use a guitar or a tuba like I play or even a drum, drum set. You have to use um, anything, any tangible object available, anything at your disposal. And uh, several people have to create different rhythms on uh, with different objects or on the ground with their feet, with their body, anything to uh, come together, coincide, to tr pr try to create music, some type of song. Um, originally, I wanted to do a, a, a dinner theme because uh, I did my song band during the intermission of um, this year's drum club play, Mission Possible. And uh, for intermission, uh, the, they were supposed to be like a dinner, not for the actors, but for the characters themselves. And uh, we, I didn't have the tools that, that, that I wanted. I wasn't able to get a, uh, a table, plates, cups, silverware to every practice that, that I wanted to do. I wanted to do two a week, and it just didn't work out. So my crew actually ended up coming together uh, without me coming up with the blacksmith theme last minute. And, and it really helped me out. Um, and it pushed me to do a lot better uh, for my crew. Um, I decided to pick people rhythmically inclined because that would really help. Uh, so you can't use instruments, and I can't really teach that. Uh, I decided to focus on band students, uh, generally because they're available and they're dedicated. Available to me, not dedicated to me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I was able to uh, catch them right after band class because that's generally when I would have my, my practices for my performance. And uh, I was kind of able to just catch them after class and hold them hostage to read personal benefit. Uh, <laughs> I did end up uh, starting to prove my research in the end, I feel, because uh, it, it, was, it was very stressful not being able to uh, have the theme, uh, have the performance that you've been working on for a month and a half uh, on the due date and having to totally scrap it and improv something totally new 
with totally new uh, tools and instruments, not instruments. Uh, <laughs> so that was a little difficult, but my team was very creative in, in helping me get my score. I got an A on my product, and I, I, can't, I can't thank them enough for that. Uh, crashing and burning. Uh, <laughs> practice, like I said, it was, it, it was a, bit, a bit difficult. I only had a month and a half for these practices, and uh, most of my crew had jobs. I have a job, and we all have extracurricular activities. Um, so it was very hard to try to find a, a date that would work for everyone, especially uh, the same throughout the week. I don't, couldn't think of the word. Uh, as I stated, no, no theme seemed to work. After the dinner theme uh, crashed and burned, uh, <laughs> it was really hard to come up with a new one. Uh, I couldn't. Uh, all, all of my ideas kind of fell through, and, uh, and I had to rely on my crew on that as much as, as much as I feel bad about it. But we pulled it together. We improv the show. And like I said, we did really good, and we had a lot of fun. Uh, sample rhythm, I, due to technical difficulties, and I apologize, I wasn't able to um, pull up a 60-second video. I wasn't able to pull up um, rhythm change for any of you. And I do apologize, because this might sound a little, a little hoarse uh, <laughs> due to the fact that it was recorded on a phone. <laughs> uh, and I swear this play today in practice. Um, request try access, I suppose. But it's, if you say request, it's going to ask. Okay. Um, well, it, that's good because it was only an eight second video and it was the same repetitive beat. <laughs> um, uh, it, at second seven and eight, it started to kind of fall apart. And had you been able to listen to it, you would, you would have been able to hear that. Uh, and about that, uh, forgetting. Like I said, it started to fall apart. We uh, we only had the one day to practice with the blacksmith theming with those kinds of tools uh, at our disposal. Um, so we did forget a lot of the material that, that we had come up with as on our way out into the stage. But uh, we, we kind of all we kind of all clicked. They were ended up ended up working pretty well. Um, dropping the okay. So. <laughs> My friend, uh, Devin Huddleston, is actually in the room over there. Uh, he requested that he be the one to uh, dolly the anvil off of the stage and out of the room. And I took him off on that offer, and I pushed the anvil onto the dolly, and he lost his footing and fell backwards. And instead of the 300-pound anvil crashing through the stage floor, it landed right on his pelvis. And I really apologize for that, Devin. <laughs> I'm very thankful that it didn't shatter your bones. <laughs> And we had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, <laughs> not <laughs> dropping the animal on your pelvis. I'm sure that wasn't fun. But uh, all in all, throughout the practices, it was pretty good crew, pretty good people, and we had a lot of laughs. Uh, the audience also thought that dropping the animal was staged, so we got some laughs out of that. <laughs> that kind of kind of helped us. Uh, my stretch, uh, reliability and availability, not necessarily on my crew or my friends. Because they were they were very good, they showed up to every practice that they were able. Um, mainly with materials, I wasn't able to do my dinner theme. I wasn't able to do uh, the second or third theme that I had come up with. We had to settle for the blacksmith theme last minute, even though it worked. Um, cornerstoning friends. Um, yes, whenever I went into the band room hoping people would sign up for my project, I uh, I focused on trying to get my friends in there. Now, traditionally, you would want to abstain from this because uh, you will in my opinion, inevitably procrastinate. You will joke around, and you won't get a whole lot done in practice, but waiting procrastinating. Um, but if you have a good set of friends, a good set of people that are uh, hardworking and dedicated and love doing the same thing as you do, then I highly recommend it, because we had a lot of fun, and it worked out for me in the end. Um, research and product compatibility. This was hard, because I researched improv improvisational dance, and I did a theatrical music performance for my product, and that doesn't really doesn't really go together. <laughs> so for my, for my trifold, I just did a art improv art <laughs> or performance. That, that really worked out. Uh, what was accomplished? I did prove my research. Um, as I stated, uh, it was it, it did end up being very stressful, and I, for one, was pretty insecure going out there not knowing what we were what we were going to do. Um, I entertained the audience. Uh, 
that was my biggest goal considering Dr. Spencer and her grandson were out there, and I, that was kind of my focus. Um, but we got a lot of um, a lot of good comments, uh, a lot of laughs, claps, and and that kind of eased the stress, I guess. And I passed. I got an A on the product. <laughs> That's a biggie there. Uh, and I had a lot of fun, uh, as I stated earlier in uh, my other slide. Again. Um, and for my, as for my uh, advice for upcoming seniors, uh, I, you should always do something that you love to do because um, it will induce a lot less stress um, whenever you actually know what you're doing. <laughs> it just makes things a whole lot easier and you'll have a really fun time. Now, relying entirely on predetermined choreography, whether it be art, uh, theater, dance, any type of performance, it can and will lead to insecurities, stress, anything under the sun. Because you don't have the amount of uh, emotional sway that you would love to have. Although, a research, uh, research was conducted by Professor Kessler McGrath last year, 2018, in August at Stratford University. And they found that you were 36% 36, 36 more likely to catch more attention, induce far more entertainment, and maybe even get a laugh or two out of your audience through an entirely improvised performance if you just wing it. Thank you very much for your time. And do my judges have any questions? What's up, Martin? Uh, was that speech? That's what we're excited too. Thanks. But was that speech also improv? I don't want to talk about it, Martin. <laughs> a little bit. It, my title is Just Wing It. It would be wrong for me not to put a little bit of improv in that. I, I feel. How do you hope this will benefit you in your future? Um, I've heard you got to do a lot of speeches in college. <laughs> and if I get good at improv now, then I think I'll pull it off then. Why did you get a last-minute 300 from Andy? From the act building, they just kind of snatched oh, okay. it. <laughs> help with Devin there. Didn't drop it. Yeah. What's up, Devin? Is, is the guy that dropped the anvil on the pelvis okay? I don't know if the pelvis is okay. <laughs> Did it heal? Did you uh, crack anything? Or was it just bruised? It was really bruised. Yeah, it was really a little bruised. Little bit, yeah, it was <laughs> Overall, Overall, okay. Thank you. You didn't mention the band room. We don't talk about what, what happened. I dropped room? nothing after the band. I definitely dropped the anvil in the band room while transporting it, and I totally cracked the tiles and chipped them on the floor. But we kind of convinced Mr. Cochran and Mr. Good that that's always been there. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't leave this room. Yeah, except this. in a recording. Oh, <laughs> <we're just> crap. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's cool. It'll be all right. They go now. <laughs> I'm out of here in a week. <laughs> <laughs> you plan on doing it in the future? No. <laughs> I hope not. It, I did have a very fun experience, though, and um, as stressful as a senior project might be, I think it, it really benefits us. And, um, yeah, it really benefits us. <laughs> it teaches you a lot. Uh, could you name off your crew based on what your uh, tripod says? <laughs> <laughs> Lillian Lewis, Devin Huddleston, Caleb Hardman, Koji Cruz, Martin Lega. Not Lega. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like You're welcome. All right. Is that the last one? Yes. Do you expect anything at less? <laughs> <laughs>